Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome. Uh, come on in. I hope that as everybody gets the notification that you are going to uh, quickly be able to come over. And <laughs> oh, yes, good to see you. Come on in, everyone. Uh, while we're still waiting for our heavenly bridegroom to call up his bride, which I strongly believe is any moment now, any moment. I, I mean, I just, I, I feel it so strongly. And it's not just me. So many others are seeing it and the eyes are being opened to so many people. And this is very interesting because I had just seen a response to, uh, oh, come on in, please, everyone. Um, I had just seen a response, a comment that was made to a community post that I made yesterday, okay? If you haven't seen that, I think it's, uh, we're gonna be discussing part of that today because I think it's just really leading up to up to this, I guess, critical mass type of moment that we're in right now. And uh, in, in this comment from our brother Lucas, what he says is that, that he woke up this morning, I guess about right when he had printed the comment, and uh, he had said, and I immediately understood that there was a pre-trib rapture. Now, from his comment, I get the impression that he might not have believed that first, but that suddenly the Holy Spirit downloads into his spirit that wait, there, the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride. And I, I, I just think that is one example. And, and then he, he noted that as a confirmation, then for him, immediately he sees the uh, post that I made and it's discussing this very issue. So I, 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 um, I, I think I, I believe that this is also one example of Holy Spirit actually opening the book that was sealed, Daniel's book that was sealed. This is yet another example. So for more and more things that are happening, I think it's down to, oh, Sister Paulette, everybody say hello to Sister Paulette. So glad to see you here. Uh, and, uh, and thank you, thank you so much. Um, I really think that what's happening is, is, is it's because we are so incredibly close, the opening or the unsealing of the book dealing with the end times is, is really gotten to the point where there is now Holy Spirit downloading instant knowledge of the pre-trib rapture of the bride and the other harvest, which, which we are going to talk about right now. Dear Sister Laura, thank you, greetings. Uh, and and I, I look for everyone, yes. Uh, oh, and, and I, I want it, uh, we just got a notice from uh, Repo Man 64. And I want to get a shout out to, to, to my brother, Mike. And I want you to know that I, I saw your, uh, saw your post earlier. And I noticed, of course, that, uh, that you've got guns of fire, my brother. And so this is what, this is what I thought. Uh, I thought that 
uh, James and John are known as the sons of thunder, right? This is just for, for you, Brother Mike. You, the, uh, known as the sons of thunder. So when we saw, this is what I want you to do. You're going to name one James, the other John, and you're going to call them the guns of thunder. How's that, right? <laughs> oh, well, that's wonderful. I'm so glad to, I, I love you, Brother Mike, and, and, and so glad to see that we are right now on this cusp. I really see that as being the case. So once again, as I'm saying right now, it is, it is so close as I understand it, that it is just the, the downloads, the opening of the eyes and the ears of those that he wants to know and understand this. It, it's just happening instantaneously now because that is in the plan of God. I think that is so amazing. But is there more than that? Yes, I believe there is. I believe there is, absolutely. And uh, from people, including myself, and including many others of the watchmen and women that are, that are out here and, and seeing this, they see numbers and symbols and things that are happening in daily life that are... Um, uh, that portend that we see that we're going like, oh yeah, rapture, rapture. It's keeping us attuned to and focused on this most awesome event and being gathered to our great and glorious bridegroom, King Jesus. Amen. And, and so here's what I'm going to do. So we are going to focus a lot today on yet the third earthquake that has now happened in Melbourne, Australia, okay? Two days ago, the third earthquake, and it has God's fingerprints all over it, frontwards and backwards. And if you've seen my uh, previous, uh, we've had now the first two earthquakes, the one that I have spoken about on a couple of occasions where I was on the fifth floor of the building downtown in uh, the Melbourne Central Business District when uh, a 6.0 earthquake hit there and all of the symbolism involved in that that was showing that it was related to the rapture. It was related to the rapture of the bride, okay? Now, then we had a second earthquake just a little bit ago, uh, a few weeks ago, excuse me. And in this second earthquake, yet again, I did another message on that and more symbolism. Jesus is coming to rapture his bride. And now, the third one, which I believe. So if we think, man, could this be one for each group? What do you think? Three rapture harvest groups and then an earthquake resurrection that is going to be symbolic for each one. I don't know. We'll consider that. Okay. But there is so much in this one that happened two days ago. We're going to talk a lot about that, and I think you're going to find it very exciting. Very, I know I did. It just really, you know, mind blown, right? Okay, so that's that's what we've got there. And then we're going to talk about the bride of Christ. And, and we are going to, and I'm hoping everyone is going to listen to this, be willing to, to hear it, okay? And then take it to the Lord. We're going to talk a lot about the bride of Christ comes out of the body, 
it is not the whole body. And just a, you don't even need to like read this so deep and carefully and, and have to have a master's degree in engineering to be able to figure this out. It is actually quite simple when you look at it. And I think that you are going to see a lot of this. And the big important point is this is something that I have been teaching from the very beginning. And I think we've got a lot more people are coming around to this and, and understanding that more. But what I find very, very interesting, and I hope that's going to be helpful to everyone, and check it out yourselves, is that our uh, dear beloved brother, Chuck Missler, who passed away, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, several years ago, but amazing, amazing work. So much stuff that he did. And one of these things included much teaching on the bride of Christ coming out of the body. And so I'm in, I, I encourage you, if you haven't seen my community post that I did yesterday, go there. I have a link to a, uh, a short uh, clip of uh, Brother Missler's work that relates to this about the bride of Christ coming out of the body and the rewards. And so one of the things that I think is so interesting here, and I have taught about this multiple times, I am not turning away from this. There's been a lot of pushback about it, but the I, I'm, I'm just hoping that you are going to watch this and understand that the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride is a reward and we're going to go into that deeper okay the rewards are so important they are or at least i'm hoping that it's going to be important to you all right so we're going to cover that deeper okay that's going to happen so we're going to do this i hope this is going to be very exciting for you let's start with a a, a quick scripture excuse me a prayer and then we'll get deep into this, okay? Dear Abba, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak and teach and give your word to our brothers and sisters and to be an encouragement and to lift you up, Jesus, and to let everyone know, to fill them with the hope and the knowledge and the expectation that you are at the door and you are about to take your bride up. I am asking Holy Spirit that you're going to anoint the minds and the hearts of all those who see this message today. And they are going to be filled with that excitement. And most of all, your love, your love. Let it fill all of our hearts now. Let us be covered, our hearts, our minds, and our souls with the precious cleansing blood of Jesus, the blood that you gave us, Jesus, that you pay for, for our salvation. Let us do that now in preparation for your return for your bride. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so let's get into this. Let's get into this. Now, let me start by saying just a few things, and that is about the the numbers and things now there's been a lot i have i can tell you that the numbers times uh but but numbers that uh, that have been appearing to me in different contexts have been off the charts now i'm not kidding you when I tell you hundreds of them, it's, it's, it's at a fever pitch now. Uh, and now I'm not going to, it would take another couple of messages just to show you them all, but just to kind of give you an idea, I just want to show you uh, just a couple of instances uh, so you can kind of get the point, okay? 
Ah, brother Mike. All right. Good to see you, brother. Guns of thunder. Okay. <laughs> That's what we want to talk about. All right. So let's let's look at, and I just printed these off. This is just from my Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Just, just that. I'm going to give you a picture so you can see that yourself. Okay. All right. And let's see if I can get you. You can see here. Okay. All right. Now, this is just from Saturday and Sunday while I was on my iPad. So these are little snapshots from my iPad. Okay. So you can see the first one, and I have been seeing multiple numbers, these things, 111, 222, 333, this one, 444, 555. It's just, I'm going like, that did not happen to me before. It wasn't those numbers, but now they are. And you see in this one, 444. I did another message previously where I discussed how all of these ultimately when you do the math, I encourage you to look, and it's called uh, 37, okay? How you get to the number 37, which is the number for Jesus, okay? There's a calculation that goes by, and it uses all of the triple numbers, 111 through 999. And when you do this calculation, that's done, I encourage you to check that out. It all points it all gives you the number 37, which is the number of Jesus, okay? All right, so here I am, and then we've got the number four is the door, and, and I'm just like, wow, wow, wow. Then, now this is all in the same day, that, as you can see, these first four, and it, it wasn't all of them, okay? Four, five, eight. I'm four, five, eight. We know that that is the Strong's number for Elimelech, which means God is king. That has happened so much, and I keep hearing the song. I'm on my way. Uh, and so I encourage you, if you're not familiar with that, oh my goodness, way too much to go into here. But four, five, eight. He is coming. God is coming. God is king. And we're going to be discussing a lot of that here in the earthquake, okay? So then next, 627, 726. So I keep seeing these both forwards and backwards. 726 is our Strong's number for the word harpazo, which is the rapture, the snatching, the, the rescue, the gathering, whatever you want to use to term that word, that is what we're talking about. Now, so I, I don't want to get into a semantic type of issue because I just want you uh, to be able to understand what the principle of the thing is and what Jesus is about to do, okay? So I keep seeing it, and as you can see here, both ways, 627, 726. It, it's just, and it just catches me off. How can I just happen to have, oh, by the way, you would think, do I spend my entire life on my iPad? Well, no, I have a life, and I, and I do have to live and work and do these kinds of, it just so happened, I don't know how, that this happened at that specific moment. And so I snapped a, 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 a screenshot going like, no way, no way, you know what I'm saying? And so then the same thing, then Sunday, first thing, this is what happened. This is what happened in, in that particular instance. I was actually sound asleep, deep dreaming. Okay. And all of a sudden I heard the voice of God saying, wake up and look and bang, I was immediately awakened out of this deep sleep. And I, I bolt like that up in the bed and I'm looking immediately at my clock, which I have on my dresser on, uh, at the end of my bed. 
And I look, and what is the time? 7.26. And I went, oh, I get your point. Thank you. Harpazo. Yes. Yes. Right? And so in this instance, I grabbed my iPad. I've still got all this time, right? I grab my iPad, I open it up, I turn it on, and I snapped this screenshot just so that I would have it to show you. You see, that's what I'm saying. That's um, so that's where that comes in. Now, I'm just like, wow, but is that all? No, no, it's not. What's interesting is like there are things like this that were happening. I get emails and and I get the uh, regular snail mail and things like that. So I actually got this thing coming in, just uh, other things that happened during life. And I ended up, you're going to love this. Let me show you. Okay. All right. Now, I want you to understand what this is. Okay. Here in Australia, we have, it's like a, a reward card. Ooh, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. A reward card. A reward. A sweet, sweet Jesus. Thank you. Folks, I just had my eyes open right there. You just saw it. Bam. Bam. I was just, thank you. Holy Spirit. Thank you so much a reward and it's called flybys right we have a flybys card which gives us reward points and um and we can use it at various different things different whether you go shopping for groceries or whether you go to buy clothes or you know department stores or hardware stores it's useful in a lot of different areas. And it's not a credit card. It's a reward card. Awesome. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And I ended up with my notification right then of what my points balance were on my flybys reward. And it was 726. Harpod, so how much, how much can we, I'm thinking like, so you know what that meant to me, folks, right? You know what that meant to me. We're about to fly. We're about to fly. I know that meant it for me. Oh, my goodness. So I'm just like going, and here's the another thing. You notice it's got my personal name on it, right? So this is for Wayne. So let me know, but I'm telling you, we all have our personal name. All those that are a member of the bride have their personal name, and they are about to get their reward of the rapture of the bride. Now, please don't get all huffy and puffy if you think, oh, no, there's no such thing as a reward. That Okay, just bear with me. Bear with me, please because it's a very important and sobering issue that I want you to understand, okay? I want you to understand this. This is going to be very deep, okay? Now, of course, as you know, I've got to have scripture always that's going to go along with this, okay? And, uh, and we're going to have several points of scripture, but I want to point out one other thing. And our scripture point that I'm going to point to right now is out of Romans chapter 13. Okay. Now I was going, I, I, I want you to know, am I not, I'm not wearing my sh uh, white shirt or anything like this. This is just kind of another little aside. I think, of course, it's winter here in Australia, right? So I've, I've got to stay warm. I love this shirt. Why? Because it always reminds me of the coat of many colors. 
And although I, I know it's not, it's, it's nothing like that. I don't know why that's the case, but, um, but it is. That's just if, in case anybody's wondering, that's what I'm doing. But I think I also look a little bit like maybe like a lumberjack or something right now. <laughs> okay. All right. Romans chapter 13. Now we're going to key in on Romans 13 verse 11. Now what verse 11 says, and we're going to cover this deeper. I'm going to read more verses than that, but let me read verse 11 to kind of just kind of pique your interest. Okay. And it says, Romans 13, verse 11, and that knowing the time that now is the, it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Now, this is out of King James. <clears throat> and we are going to discuss that a little bit more because this is the important thing, awaking out of sleep, okay? And, uh, and awaking in time to understand, to prepare for, be ready for Jesus to call up his bride. Now, what I want to do, I'm going to show you a few things a little bit more out of this, okay? Now, I'm going to read the, this passage, Romans chapter 13. I'm going to read you verses 10 through 14, okay? And so I can give you the context here, and then we're going to go into a little bit further into verse 11, okay? Romans 13, starting at verse 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whoa, okay. Okay. <sighs> All right, thank you, Abba. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we, we believed. Tw verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now, just as a point, who is putting on that? That would be the people, right? Okay, that's something you have to do is something that they are telling you to do. Okay, let us, and he's including himself in that, cast off the works of darkness let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, I'm gonna, I want to make a point now. This is in the book of Romans. Now, who is Paul? Uh, who is Paul speaking to right now? He's speaking to believers at the church in Rome, okay? So for those who might want to say, oh, yeah, Brother Wayne, okay, but that's not talking to believers. Oh, yes, it is. So you can't take this verse and just cast it away as if it has no meaning for you. If you're a believer... It, it's for you, right? It was also for Paul. He put himself in the same group. He is the one who wrote this, right? Okay. There's a few more things that I want to point out about this. This is talking about, I think, watchmen. And so this is what I'm doing. The time is now, right? And it is a high watch time. And what are we as watchmen and women doing right now? We are sending the alarm to awake everyone out of their sleep. That's what we do, okay? And of course the scripture says, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. 
Now, I want to give you something that's a little bit different because if you don't look at it and you think our salvation is nearer, well, wait a minute. He can't be talking about salvation uh, because that's uh, uh, only then for unbelievers, right? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, let me discuss just exactly because I think that that is the wrong translation of the word that should be there. I'm sorry for you King James only guys that you think every word is perfectly there, but let me give you something to consider here, okay? I love the King James, no question about it. But do your study, folks. Get down into this word and you're going to find these nuggets of wisdom that are just amazing to you. All right, so here's what I did. I went and this is the... Greek text for Romans 13, verse 11. So if you can take a snapshot of that. Okay. All right. So the one thing that I want to, uh, to highlight out of this verse is the, um, the word, uh, the Greek word for salvation. That is soteria. That's the word that they're using here that they have translated as salvation. But as you can see, soteria is the feminine of the derivative of soter as a noun, meaning rescue or safety. Now, what I would say to you, I, I think... That, that it fits very well that our rescue is nearer now than when we believed, right? So when we believe, then we become, uh, we start looking at the eligibility for harvest, right? The eligibility to be uh, in the body of Christ or the bride of Christ, right? That happens at salvation, right? But I think this word that they have translated salvation would be better in our instance as rescue, which it shows here. And, and if you read it like that, so this is what it would then read. And knowing the time that now is, it is high time, so it's a high watch time now. It's high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our rescue nearer than when we believed. Okay, so let's, let's look at it and consider it from that standpoint. What are we looking for? We're looking for our rescue. And that, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, that. That, brothers and sisters, I believe, is what we are looking at right there. This is definitely a high watch time. Now, let's talk about high watch time for just a second, okay? And, and this is one of the things that I want to discuss about that. Okay, I want you to consider this. And that is that um, that the there are in fact three harvests. Many of you are are open into the understanding that there are three harvests. There is a pre-trib, a mid-trib, and a post-trib. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of those into detail. I want to focus much of my time today on the pre-trib rapture reward of the bride, okay? Now, there is, um, uh, there is a, let's see, what did I have here? I want you to consider those three harvests, barley, wheat, and grapes, just in general, I'm not talking about flax and I'm not talking about these, uh, you know, uh, dates or it, I'm, what I'm just, I'm, I'm just using the general terms to be able to cover 
barley harvest, which happens first, wheat harvest, which happens second, and grapes or fruit harvest, which happens last, first, second, and third, okay? And I am saying that in each of those instances, there's a pre-trib, a mid-trib, and a post-trib connection to those harvests, all right? And, uh, and so one of the things that, uh, that there is a difference in understanding or uh, kind of where groups tend to go to, the, the, there's the question of does, you know, does this happen on a feast day? Does it not happen on a feast day? Is it imminent? Could it happen at any moment? It could have happened at, you know, a thousand years ago. It can happen in, in five minutes from now. These different ideas. Well, I think that those different ideas, they're not necessarily wrong any more than the pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib harvest groups being wrong. They're all correct. So I'm thinking that it may be possible, and consider this, that the barley harvest, don't discount the barley harvest, or, or we wouldn't have had a barley harvest, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean like, oh yeah, that was, all, they had, that was already addressed 2,000 years ago. No, no, I don't believe so. If that was the case, then there would be no need for us to continue looking at and, and, and according to the word of God, considering to do that, right? Considering to look at those harvests because they, uh, they are still important. Not everything is complete there. So if we consider the barley harvest as being representative of the pre-tribulational rapture or gathering reward of the bride, I keep pointing that out because I'm going to go into this in deeper detail, uh, and that taking place without any feast day. Think about it this way. So in other words, and, and I think it's based on a focus. This is one of the things that I'm starting to, I think like, wow, okay, that would make sense. If we are not focused on things around in the earth, looking at those, that doesn't mean that we're completely blind to them. Obviously, we're looking around at those things that are happening, right? But consider that the bride of Christ, which is focused only on Jesus, can happen without any feast day that it truly can happen eminently at any time, okay? Think about that. And then why then would the second harvest, the second harvest, the wheat harvest, that would be the, the second group that would be looking more directly at the things on the earth, looking directly at uh, the wheat harvest, looking directly at that falling on a feast day. And then the Jewish uh, remnant and, uh, that it's going to happen on a feast day when Jesus returns on Yom Kippur, okay? I, I just think that's worth considering. Uh, rather than saying, nope, there's only one and it's only going to happen on this time and it's got to happen here. I, I think you would be missing out so much if you look at it that way. I think you would really seriously be missing out. Just consider that this might be the case, right? Consider why, oh, oh stomach, everybody can hear that probably on the, I don't eat before I do these because I, I don't want my uh, uh, stomach to be digesting after I'm doing food, right? Okay. Sorry about that. If you can hear that, be quiet. Okay. All right. Let's get into this earthquake. Okay. Wow. This earthquake. Two days ago, I want to show you this. 
and uh, so that you can follow along with this because there's a lot that goes into this, okay? Look right now, take a snapshot of this and this, okay? All right. Now, this is a snapshot that I got from our news. You can see down there, it's Channel 9 News here in Australia, in, in Melbourne. <clears throat> and uh, this is what it says. This is from two days ago. Thousands of Victorians were startled by tremors early this morning as a magnitude 4.6 earthquake rattled part of the state. The quake hit 127 kilometers east of Melbourne near Rawson at about 1.32 a.m. It was recorded at a depth of seven kilometers. The tremors were felt by about 7,000 people, according to Geoscience Australia, including in Melbourne. All right. Now, oh, this is so pregnant with everything. And once again, it just, wow with the first one and the second one, and now this third one. Now you notice that I have uh, every number highlighted in this instance, okay? Now, obviously, at a depth of seven kilometers and 7,000 people, I don't have to tell you the number seven is the divine number, right? But this is going to, I looked at everything else. I started looking at and I started getting this information, this type of download. So I was thinking like, wait a minute, there's a lot that's being, that I'm seeing here. There's a lot that I'm seeing here. And so I made a snapshot of this and I started then getting this information. All right. This is the information that I got. The quake hit 127 kilometers east of Melbourne. Okay. Immediately what came to mind is Psalm 127. And I went, and I'm going to cover this with you now. So follow along with me. Why was it Psalm 127? I, I, I didn't know, but that's what... That's what came to my spirit. So, but let me, let me then talk about that for just a moment. Let's read Psalm 127. This is from the KJV once again. <clears throat> my goodness. Shush. All right. Uh, 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman, waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage to the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy, is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. There, how many of those things? Whoa, wait a minute. We're mentioning the watchman and the waking and the rising up and the reward. I'm like, okay, wait, 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 okay. My, my, my head was just like going along. Well, then I looked up and I found this thing on uh, a simple synopsis of Psalm 127. And this is what it says. And I, I, I can show you too if you're interested. You can see that here. Okay. And, and this is what it says. Psalm 127 tells people to remember that it was God who saved their city from enemies. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
God had given them everything that was valuable to them. Safety, houses, food, children, and peace. It was God who let them work hard to build houses. It was God who let them do the other things in the psalm. And I'm going like, wait, wait. All of this keeps pointing to God. These are God's fingerprints, brothers and sisters. That's what I'm saying, okay? But I didn't stop there. I'm like, wow, okay, this is God. This is God, okay? Then I looked up the next number, 132, okay? And that 132, what did I get? Psalm 132. Wow. And what is Psalm 132? I'm just, I'm not going to read the whole Psalm because it's actually a longer Psalm. I'm just going to read you this. It's a song of a sense, a sense. Hold on to this. It's a big red flag, ascending. Okay. A song of a sense. Oh Lord, remember David and all of the hardship he endured till I find a place for the Lord a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. So what is Psalm 132 about? It says the two halves of Psalm 132 are joined together and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the house, the temple David wanted to build as a dwelling place for the Lord in Zion. But he is also the son of David, the eternal king who God promised will rule his people with love and justice forever. Once again, God, 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 Jesus, and Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. So if uh, I, I, I hope you don't bristle about that. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he is God now, okay? So I just want you to know that. But we're going to, so I've talked about Psalm 127, talks about God. Psalm 132, a song of ascents about God, and it identifies that God being Jesus now, I want to go in and I want to discuss something else. Wait a minute. What are the songs of ascent? And I want this to encourage you, brothers and sisters. How are you getting all this from an earthquake? Okay, just keep, let's keep going with this. There is so much here. So I looked up the songs of ascent. Now, this is from gotquestions.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, thank you, Mama. All right, and this is what it says to that very question. Answer, the Psalms of Ascent are a special group of psalms comprising Psalms 120 through 134. They are also called pilgrim psalms. Four of these psalms are attributed to King David and one to Solomon, which is Psalm 127 that we just spoke about. Just hold on to that. While the remaining 10 are anonymous, the city in Jerusalem is situated on a high hill. Jews traveling to Jerusalem for one of the three main annual Jewish festivals traditionally sang these songs on the ascent to the uphill road to the city. According to some traditions, the Jewish priests also sang some of the songs of ascent as they walked up the steps to the temple in Jerusalem. Each of the psalms in this collection begins with the title, A Psalm of Ascents. While perhaps they were not originally composed for this purpose, these psalms were later grouped together for use in traveling towards Jerusalem for the yearly Jewish festivals or feast, right? 
Now that's very interesting as we're looking towards, you know, Feast of Pentecost, Feast of New Wine, those kinds of things. But hold on, hold on. I'm thinking that's very interesting to look at. Then here's something very interesting to go along with that. The theme of each song of ascent offers much encouragement for those who seek to worship God today. Psalm 120, theme, God's presence during distress. Psalm 121, theme, joyful praise to the Lord. Psalm 122, theme, prayer for Jerusalem. Psalm 123, patience for God's mercy. Psalm 124, help comes from the Lord. Psalm 125, prayer for God's blessing upon his people. Psalm 126, the Lord has done great things. Psalm 127, God's blessings on man's efforts. Psalm 128, joy for those who follow God's ways. Psalm 129, a cry for help to the Lord. Psalm 130, a prayer of repentance. Psalm 131, surrender as a child to the Lord. And Psalm 132, God's sovereign plan for his people. Whoa, wait, what was that again? As we are ascending, we are being shown God's sovereign plan for his people. Now, let's go ahead and finish this. Psalm 133, praise of brotherly fellowship and unity. And Psalm 134, praise to God in his temple. But I find this very interesting. Psalm 127 is, and 132 is what I'm showing out of here. Psalm 127, the theme is God's blessings on man's efforts to watch, to prepare, to be ready. Psalm 132, for God's sovereign plan for his people. Hmm, okay, just consider that. But how amazing is this? The Psalms of Ascent as they keep going up. And what have we been looking at? 22, the word mountain, right? Going up the mountain, arising, ascending. And then for Psalm 127 to be written by Solomon, immediately I'm thinking of the Song of Songs. And chapter 2, verse 10, arise, come up, come away, my love, my darling, my fair one. I, I'm just, wow, wow, okay. And that's not all. Okay, we've still got a lot more, folks. Because we're really going to shake this one. So I'm thinking like, wow. Wow, wait, I'm thinking there's more. There's got to be more. There's more there. I looked up 46. Why not, right? All of these numbers are here for a reason. And so I looked up 46, and I looked that up in Strong's, okay? Strong's number 46, and that is the word a beer, okay? And that is mighty when spoken of God or mighty one. It is strong or mighty, and it's used only to describe God. That's it, right? And is actually an old name for God, the poetic name, the strong, okay? Now, here's one of the interesting things out of this usage and they give examples. And where do you think two of the examples come from? Psalm 132. So Psalm 132, verse two, he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Psalms 132, verse five, a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty, God of Jacob. That's the word there. The, the word uh, that, wow, 
That that is so amazing. So again, 46. That harkens back to Psalms 132. God. That's a, the word for God, and it's only used for God. We've got Psalms 132 talking about God. We've got Psalms 127 talking about God. I'm just like, you see where my I, I'm just like, wow. And is that all? No. I'm thinking like, okay, well, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. I said, maybe I'm not understanding it right. So here's what I did. I went ahead after I looked this up. So Strong's, that sounded pretty good. Uh, so then I looked up Strong's uh, 721, the backwards reading of 127. This is very interesting. I thought, wow, that is the word arneon. That is the word for a lamb, specifically a little lamb. And, and so it's um, what, what we have out of Thayer's Greek lexicon Again, I was stunned. In John 21, verse 15, that term for little lamb is used of Christ innocently suffering and dying to expiate the sins of men, very often in Revelation, as Revelation 5, 6, 8, and 5, Revelation 5, verse 6, verse 8, verse 12, etc. Okay? Once again, it's about God, forwards and backwards. Am I done yet? Nope. How about if we find the backwards of 132? Okay. So I looked that up. 231 in Strong's Halius, which means a fisherman. Interesting. Who's the greatest fisherman of all? That would once again be Jesus. And what do we see out of Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, where Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He's the greatest fisherman. He is the innocent lamb. He is the great and mighty God. He is our great king, Lord and heavenly bridegroom, Praise God. He is coming, brothers and sisters. He is coming. And, and I still wasn't even finished with that. I still wasn't even finished. Let me draw your attention back to the snapshot that I took and look at the picture that's in there. That says, uh, that's an advertisement, right? And it's for Cirque du Soleil. But you see, it's crystal, a breakthrough ice experience. The Australian tour, July through September 2023. And the first thing I thought, doesn't that look like a rapture of the bride right there? You can see oh, everyone being drawn up. I thought, yes, yes, yes. And all of this from the third earthquake. And if it doesn't get your attention, brothers and sisters, this is life symbolizing prophetic fulfillment right here. I really believe that. If you can't look at these signs and see this, then, then I pray for you. I, I, I pray that uh, Holy Spirit will open your eyes and ears, your heart of understanding so that you can see this because it is so very close, all right? Now, that is the end of the first hour here, okay? All right. I want, uh, so if anyone wants to be able to, to say that, so we are going to go in to another hour, and uh, and I am going to uh, discuss uh, a, a whole nother section about the bride and the body. 
So let's plan on doing that now. So let's end this first topic. And now let's go in to the next one. Okay. Ah, thank you, Abba. All right, let's start our two. And this is what, what I want to start with is I want to start with, first off, a dream that I had. And, uh, and actually, I was, I was very discouraged about it, okay, initially. Hold on. And uh, what that was, was in this dream, I, I, I was looking at this banquet table and it was huge and ornate. And I knew that it belonged to me. Uh, I don't know in what respect but I knew that it belonged to me somehow, okay? And that it was for a banquet, a huge, ornate, elaborate banquet. And then in this dream, what happens is that uh, Sir Charles Branson, and I, I'm thinking, I don't know why that was the case, but uh, at least I didn't at, at that time, Sir Charles Branson took, was trying to take the, uh, the banqueting table from me and to pull it, uh, not from me, it wasn't in my possession, but from my ownership, I guess I should say, and take it, and he was taking it into this place, he was trying to pull it down to the earth, okay? For some reason, this banqueting table, which we would think, was not on earth. And I was looking down, and I saw the banquet table going, right? And I said, no, you can't do that. And I go then to grab the table, and as I grab the table, and, and I look, back, then this huge door goes, closes. And I said, oh, no, 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 this, no. And I knew I could not get out. I knew that there was no way to get into that door. And, uh, and, and I, I awoke at that moment and I was sorely disheartened because I thought that what that meant was that here uh, Branson was representative. So he's part of Virgin Enterprises, right? He, Virgin Airlines and that kind of thing. So was he representative of the virgins, right? And uh, maybe the foolish virgins then that uh, are that let us have of your oil, let us have of your banqueting table. And no, you can't have that. But rather than just being focused on that, I go and try to get it from them to, to, to as if uh, I change my focus, right? And in that change of focus, then this door is shut. And I was thinking to myself, wait a minute, is that the rapture door? And is it possible I could actually now miss this? And, and am I missing something, right? And I was immediately crestfallen. I, I was like, no, Lord, no, no. And and I was thinking all to myself, what, what could it mean? What... Or, or was it was it for someone else or whatever? And and what it did is it drew me into prayer immediately, and I got down on my uh, knees and I was just like, 
Lord, no, please tell me what this means. Brothers and sisters, as clear, crystal clear as a bell, Abba spoke to me and he said, that was not for me. And then my eyes opened up again and I went, I understood it. It was like, yeah, that was the enemy trying to steal my joy. That's that's why it didn't look like one of my God dreams, which are so vibrant and clear and everything else. And then I realized, wait a minute, brothers and sisters, we do have an enemy that no matter what wants to steal your joy wants to get you into the flesh, wants to get your focus off of Jesus. And I don't care if you are strong in the spirit or not, you have to be aware, you have to be wary of your enemy, right? Because it says that he, as a roaring lion, seeks who may he may uh, devour. Let's not let him do that. Whenever you see anything that tries to do that right now, then you're going to, I want you to take it to prayer immediately. Don't just assume that what you have been given there, if it's in a dream or a vision or whatever, take it. Let Holy Spirit give you understanding in that. Take it to your heavenly father. Let him in, encourage you and to fill you with his wisdom. And you're going to find in a lot of these instances that it may not be from him at all, that it's from the enemy. And I was filled with this joy and this peace. Oh, it was so amazing. I, I just like, like a flower, like I bloomed. It was just like I went from this withered moment to suddenly all opened up and, and joyful and just, wow. When I say joyous, it wasn't like that kind of like, whoo, glad I missed that. No, I mean, really deeply filled with joy. And it was like that for hours and hours. I was just so amazingly filled with that and it made such a difference and i knew that this was going to be this is going to be something that's going to happen right we need to be focused on jesus we need to be in prayer we need to be repentant when i say repentant i mean not for salvation but for cleansing for turning away from the flesh for seeking forgiveness of those things that that we have done that and we do so that we will be cleansed from those that's what i'm saying we don't want spot or wrinkle there's a difference between having a wedding dress on and having a wedding dress that's covered in spots and wrinkles right it's still a wedding dress but we don't want spots or wrinkles right? So just think about that. How do you get rid of the dirty feet? You have Jesus wash them like he says he wants to do. Is that salvation cleansing? No, it's the cleansing of your, your, your uh, cleansing of the dirtiness, the filthiness of the world as we walk through it, because that's just part of it. We're still in this flesh until he changes it, which is about to be so soon. Just be willing, just be willing to turn away from those things and to, to ask for cleansing or forgiveness. Turn to him, turn to him and accept his free gift. It, I mean, and when I say free gift, he wants to, all of it is a free gift, right? It's, uh, but not for salvation. That is different. It's part of your walk. The cleansing that we do as we walk through this, as we grow in our faith, in our knowledge of Jesus, we have to constantly 
you know, dust off the, the pan, you know, clean, clean that stuff off because we get in there. Okay. And then we keep moving forward. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Let's, let's do that. So don't bristle as like, oh, Wayne's preaching works. No, you will have works after you're saved. And I do hope that you will consider that, okay? Just because you're wearing a wedding dress doesn't mean it's white and clean, okay? All right. So just because you're wearing garments of salvation doesn't mean they aren't spotted. We've got to clean them. And the Bible tells us that we have to prepare that. We're going to talk about that more, okay? All right. There is, uh, let's see, let me look at, all right, let me give you the theme of this one. Now, I'm going to show you this, and I don't think anyone really now has any problem with it, and that is this, okay? The pre-tribulation rapture, the bride is not the saints of the tribulation, okay? All right. Now, I want you to understand something. Not many people, some do, but not many people have a problem for, for out of those that understand in a, and uh, believe in a pre-tribulation harvest don't have as much of a problem as believing that there are going to be saints during the tribulation period. But here's the thing they tend to also want to think, and this is what I'm hoping to get you to understand. If you already know there's going to be two groups of people there, why not actually then be more open to listening to the fact that everyone left is not an unbeliever, that it is not all believers are going to be raptured. They are all the bride. We're going to see that's not the case. And, and, and I'm going to explain it in more detail. And more and more people are coming to this understanding. And, and I think it's very important to see that. Okay. Now, there's a lot more that I cover in, in dealing with. The only reason I point out this one little thing is I want to prime you to the idea that there's more than one harvest group. Okay. All right. So, and, and if you're understanding that those uh, that are uh, harvested, raptured, those, the ones that are gathered, during the tribulation that it is they're they're not part of the bride that was harvested previously pre-trib okay all right now i want to discuss why how can how can that be the case am i am i trying to make the bride some elite aloof you know kind of no i'm not doing that at all and in fact, quite the opposite. The, the I, I think that the one difference um, that I can probably highlight there's there's several, but one difference that I can highlight is that the bride of Christ is the most intimate part of the body, and. They're the most intimate because they desire that relationship. And can I say that everyone does not desire that relationship? I, I, I think, sure, yes, absolutely, right? Not everyone does. And I'm going to point this out because our dear brother, um, Lee Brainerd uh, from Soothkeep, and, and, and if you haven't, Checked him out. I'm like, please go ahead, <laughs> check him out. I, I don't know how you could have missed him so far, but go ahead and uh, and subscribe to his channel and check out some of these things. And I'm going to discuss one of the more recent uh, videos he have that's going to relate. Yes, 
relate to just what I'm talking about right now. Okay, and uh, and so let's first look at, and I'm going to show you some slides from uh, uh, a teaching by Chuck Missler. I've changed these so that you can see them easier, but I've got a couple of uh, select ones here so I can kind of encourage you to go check this out, okay? And this is what, now this is from Chuck Missler's teaching, okay? And I'm, so I want to show you that where he was going and what he shows here. And so this is what he sees from the bride of Christ. And, and so this is one of his slides here, okay? All right. So what I'm going to show you, this is what he's talking about the bride of Christ. So who or what is the bride of Christ? Now, you can see right at the top, he says it's a selection taken out of his, Jesus's body, the most intimate subset of the body. Now, you can don't bristle at me when I have been teaching this since I started this channel, okay? And I have tried many times to be able to point out, look, this is not something that is just some strange teaching, but it is, it's what comes out from the scriptures. And so what he points out, just a couple, I've actually done messages where I've listed over 20 different symbols where you can see this same symbology taking place. But here, out of this slide, from uh, 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 Brother Missler, he shows Eve taken out of Adam. I've discussed this several times in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 20 through 23, where a rib, a part of the body, is taken out and outside of where Jesus is, excuse me, I'm saying Jesus because Jesus is the second Adam and it's symbolic of him. The rib was taken outside of where Adam was, fashioned into his bride. And then the bride was taken to be with Adam, okay? It wasn't the whole body. It wasn't some kind of symbiotic or cell division type of thing. It was one member, the rib that was closest to his heart. That was what the bride was fashioned from. Okay. All right. And that's where it comes out of. And he uses a second one. Eliezer's selection of Isaac's bride from among his own people. So in other words, the bride was taken out of the body of the people that were all his, right? That's in Genesis 24, verse 4. I've discussed that as well, as, as well as many, many others, right? When you start, when you see this, when you understand this, then it really starts to make more sense. And, and it, it's not because of anything else other than the circle of intimacy, I've done messages on that as well, that there is one, there's out of all of the people at different levels, which is like we have different levels of friendship. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, uh, hopefully you are, if you're married, you're only married to one person because out of all of the people you could have chosen, you chose one, right? That's the idea, right? So the bride of Christ comes from out of the body. It is not the body. It comes from a misreading. It's, if you read it properly, and it's, it's not hard to see, it's not that at all. The bride is not equal to the body. The bride comes out of the body, okay? Now, why am I saying that? Why is this important? Okay. It's because 
of uh, the bride being, as uh, Brother Chuck Missler says, it's an intimate subset, right? Now, what, the reason why I mention uh, Brother Lee Brainerd is because he just had a video uh, several days ago, and it's called Rapture Nugget Amazing Relationships. Now, I'm, I'm going to read to you from part of his uh, transcript out of this one, uh, and, and it's going to kind of give you uh, the key point that he covers. If you haven't seen it, please go check it out. It's, it's, it's good, okay? Uh, so, but this is from his transcript because I want you to see what he's saying from his words that I think it's going to help open you up a little bit more. He did a real good job in doing this. It says here, hi, I'm Lee Brainerd and welcome to Sooth Keep. Today, I would like to encourage your hearts with another rapture nugget today. We're, or another rapture nugget. Today, we're going to zoom in, especially on the glorious relationships that the believers are going to experience in heaven. Now, folks like me, and he's saying this himself, folks like me are wired to think more about the activities we're going to be engaged in in heaven and the cool possessions that we are going to have in heaven. We think about these things more than we think about the relationships. I want I, that hopefully will perk your ears up, okay? Let me read that again. We think about these things more than we think about the relationships. And he goes on. And this isn't necessarily wrong. I agree. Some people are just wired to be goal-oriented rather than people-oriented. But people-oriented people think much differently when they think about heaven. Their deepest longings are for wonderful relationships in heaven. Amen. 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 And amen. That's exactly why I am so keen, so keen on this. The bride is the one who's the intimate one who wants to have that intimate relationship with Jesus. I don't care about a mansion. It's nice. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, really, thank you. All of that is nice. Having pets and things, all that is wonderful. But my relationship, sorry, my relationship with Jesus, if I can't have that, I don't want heaven. That is how much it means to me. I want Jesus so badly above all things, all things, all activities, all possessions, all anything. Jesus I want to be my great and awesome reward, my reward of rewards. And that's interesting. Reward, reward. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what it is. Jesus and him alone for all eternity. That's what a bride says. That's what a bride says. I want you and you alone as my husband for the rest of my life. That's what we would say here for Jesus, for all of eternity, nothing but you, only you. Do you understand that? Now, Lee is saying something that is absolutely true. There are a group of people, such as he's saying that he falls into, that is focused on the possessions that we'll have there, the activities, goal-oriented people. And that is what I think, and this is what I believe the left behind church, the main body that is left behind. Now, hold on to that. Don't bristle on that. Follow me for a minute. Jesus is going to be rapturing his bride 
That's going to happen first. That's going to happen first. But those that are focused on goals and doing things here and that sort of thing, that doesn't mean that they're part of that not part of the body. They are. Are they saved? Yes. Are they going to go? Yes. Are they going to go in the pre-trib group? No. They will likely go in the mid-trib group. Do you understand? That's what I'm trying to say. And this is this is this is not anything bad. God has his plan, as I pointed out earlier. He has a sovereign will and a sovereign plan. And he has chosen certain people for certain things in certain groups to, to be in a certain place. He has chosen people to be members, to do their part as members. Uh, sounds like works, Wayne. Okay. It's, it, 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 in a sense, okay, what does it sound like? Are there works? Yes. Is it works for salvation? No, because we have good works that are prepared for us after we are saved. And so that's what I see is the continuation of that. But think about it like this. Why? Uh, but let's just talk about, for example, for those types of people that say, why are you doing looking for Jesus to come now? Why, when you should be doing more work for the Lord? Ooh, there's that nasty word, work, right? Uh, you should be reaching out to more people and reaching out to Christ, right? Okay. And I don't disagree. However, there is a time and a place for everything. That's what the word tells us. There is a season for everything under the sun. That's what the word tells us. And I want you to think about Mary and Martha for just a moment. And I want you to see that as an example of the pre-trib rapture of the bride and the mid-trib rapture of those continuing to work. Why? Hold on. So here's Mary and Martha, their sisters, just like uh, the, just like, uh, well, strike that for a moment. Okay, so Mary and Martha are sisters and they are beloved by Jesus. And they have a brother named Lazarus. Lazarus, of course, dies, as, as we know in there. But when Jesus comes over, Mary sits down at Jesus' feet. She's looking up, listening intently to his words and everything else. It's all focused completely on Jesus. Now, then what happens? Martha She's thinking of goal-oriented things, just like Brother Lee is talking about. She's thinking, oh, we've got to get dinner ready. We've got to set this place. We've got to set the table. We've got to do this thing and that thing and one thing and another and get ready to serve. I want to make sure all this is uh, done at the same time. I don't want the food to be cold. I want to make sure you, you understand what I'm saying. So then she says, wait a minute, where's Mary? Why isn't she helping me? So I can just imagine she walks in, arms on her hips, saying, Jesus, tell Mary to get up and help me. I'm doing this all myself. And what does he say? Martha, Martha, you are careful about many things. But Mary has chosen the better thing. And what she has chosen will not be taken from her. Now, what does that mean? Now, of course, obviously I'm paraphrasing, so I encourage you to go check this out. Mary has chosen the better part. That's what Jesus himself says. To be at his feet when he came into their house, that's immediately what she did. That's not what Martha did. 
It doesn't mean that Martha did not care about Jesus or want anything to do with Jesus. Her focus was on the goal-oriented serving him. But he said that what Mary did was not going to be taken away from her. But the biggest point is she chose the better thing. She chose the better thing. Does that mean that serving Jesus is not a good thing? No. It just meant that being focused on him was the better thing. Do you understand? That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's not my words. That's Jesus's very words. That's what he said. You understand? Okay. So what does that mean? So who went to Jesus first? Mary. Who came later? Martha. Do you understand? Okay. All right. Uh, and, and so I want you to understand that this, an intimate relationship. And then one of the things I always pointed out and always made a strong impact on me personally is that when we die, we don't take anything with us. And I've always felt that the most important thing that we have, and I've always felt that, are relationships. Because that's all we have at the end of the day. So it's always been more important to me. And so if I, as I've understood the differences, or as it's been revealed to me, I guess, that, wait a minute, if, if this is just a shadow of what it is over there, and then in, in when I died and, and I actually experienced, I tasted this for myself, oh yeah, that was it, done, <laughs> that was done. It was only relationship with Jesus from that moment and always will be for me. Nothing else will do. Does that mean that those that are like Lee, that those that are goal oriented are thought of any less? No, but I can tell you the plan for that group is different. It's an awesome plan, by the way, awesome plan. And, uh, but it's different and it's for the body. The body then will be taken at mid-trib. And I use that as a term, uh, Brother Mike, I, I, and, and, and I love you, brother. It, I, I'm not saying that, that you are wrong or anything else like that. Well, all I'm saying is that if we look at things, it's easier to be able to break it down, beginning, middle, end, uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. It's much easier to calculate it based on that way. Um, but in either case, and, and the same thing uh, occurs, the, uh, and, and, and I understand how that looks. Is it three and a half years? No, I got, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it does appear that there is a mid-trib harvest rapture event, and I've covered that in a lot of detail. Others have as well. And, uh, and, and I, I would actually think that it's probably more important to think about it in these terms that, um, that, that it's not going to be pre-trib, right? And that it will happen next. That's maybe that's the easier way to be able to look at that. I hope that it is. All right. So if we then go based on the fact that, uh, and, and I'm saying it as, as a fact, I, I, based on what I have personally experienced and the way that things are working for me, um, I look at this and, and I say, all right, the barley harvest, the first group, the white pearls of barley that are harvested and winnowed with Holy Spirit first, they are the first group harvested. And there's, there's a lot that goes into that. But why, why 
Why? Because they were willing to pick up their cross out of love for Jesus. They listened to him. And they say, when he says, pick up your cross daily and follow me, we say, because of love for you, Jesus, I'm going to do that. It's hard. It's difficult. It is stifling sometimes. It is a, a struggle beyond words. And, and so, but the payoff is something that I want so desperately bad. And others that feel the same way also look at it the same way, right? All right. So here's one of the things that I want to address next. Wedding preparations. Okay. Now there's there's a bunch of groups that I think that it's 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 not good to uh, not good to talk. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? There's another group, and maybe uh, others have, have known they they want to make one harvest, and I think that they have to make it one harvest so that they can guarantee that under any circumstance, whether they are focused on Jesus or not, they will go into this harvest. It, it's almost like, you know, I, I don't know how to say this. And, uh, and so they also then make one, one resurrection. Uh, what is the, um, uh, the term that used uh, by, by our brother, Bob Barber? He says the rapture resurrection event. He groups those together as if it's a one and only thing. There's one resurrection and that's one rapture and that is it. But I strongly disagree. I strongly disagree with that because there's way too much scripture. Now, does that, does that mean that, that, that I don't consider him a brother? No, absolutely not. Of course he is. Of course he is. But I strongly disagree from that particular approach. And so uh, let's see. And, and let me discuss that for just a minute, and, and we'll talk about uh, wedding preparations on how the bride is to be able to prepare. Oh, one of those nasty works words again. Okay. All right. Here is another um, slide from Brother Missler. And if you want, you can take a snapshot of that. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, now let's discuss this. This is talking about what I have once again said many times. <clears throat> that the first resurrection and the second resurrections are not numerical, meaning that one happens first and the other happens after. It is a type. There is one type of resurrection, and then there's a second type of resurrection, okay? Now, where do we get that? What do we see? Because we know that there are all kinds of different people that's going to be a part of the first resurrection. And so what Brother Missler has in this particular instance, he shows, and he says specifically the same thing, the first resurrection is a category, including these various different ones, which I, 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 I had to laugh at this because he shows A, Christ's resurrection, the first roots, B, the dead saints at the rapture, C, martyred great tribulation saints raised at Christ's return, D, believing Old Testament saints, but I'm thinking like, whoa, wait a minute, you forgot the kind of a whole big category here. What about us living guys that are here at uh, the, the rapture? They're like, you missed one. And it's kind of a big one. So anyway, but my point is, and this is the other thing too. Now, while uh, uh, Brother Missler may not have uh, necessarily have seen the three harvest groups, 
he's alluding to that and he's seeing various different parts that are being open to him at the time when he did this uh, did these teachings such as the bride coming out of the body right being separate not the same thing bride does not equal body the bride comes out it is a subset okay and the same thing with the so blessed are those who take part part well wait a minute how can you take part in a first resurrection unless it has parts right all right um it, it, you're either if, if you believe that it's one event then then how can you take part in it okay so they all can't go in at the same time the believing old testament saints and this is another thing that i'm going like that's what i've also been teaching it's so great to, for me to be able to see some of these old teachings myself. And I'm all like, eh, eh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just like he shows out of Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where I have uh, also taught that the Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected at the end of the tribulation, right? And that's where I get that. They haven't gone yet. They haven't received any uh, resurrection or new bodies or anything like that. They will, and they haven't been part of the resurrection, and they won't until the end of the tribulation when the, the rest that are in that group are also resurrected. So there is an order. There are groups that are included in this, and I think that what that indicates or at least it does to me is that if there are multiple parts to the resurrection does it seem reasonable i think it does for there to be multiple parts to the harvest especially if you're already seeing that well yeah i see at least more than one group just because you only see two does not mean you need to try to twist certain things to make there only be one group so that you can fit into it. I don't think that that is wise. And I don't think that is helpful either. Um, why not just explain to everyone what the groups are, what each person is, Pray that the Lord shows you uh, where, which group you fit into and why. So the, I think that probably more than anything else, uh, if, if, if you're thinking that there's only one rapture so that you can be a part of it, uh, one, that's the only way that you can make sure that you're part of a pre-tribulation rapture right? And, uh, and so you have to make the body equal to the bride. So that makes you part of the bride too. And, and yet at the same time, you don't have to do anything to prepare yourself. Hmm. I think that that would, that's, that's probably not a good thing, right? And, and as we talk about the wedding resurrections, you're going to see that. All right. Second resurrection, that's going to be all of the wicked judged. Uh, well, uh, that, that's going to happen. And just as the final note, as he points out there, not two events chronologically, but two categories. Now, of course, having been an engineer myself, I, and I, can, I can understand the way he's talking about uh, subsets and, and categories rather than you know, because you're looking at Venn diagrams and how you can, you know, like, okay, there's this group. There's a subset of this group. There's an intersection with this group. And it, it's not hard to see that when you graph it out. But that's what it is. They're categories, not individual events. So love you, brother Barber. But it's not a rapture resurrection event singular. Um and, and there's a reason for that. So when we unpack this, uh, sorry, 
uh, when we unpack this, we can see that there are, there's a bunch of little, there's a bunch of moving parts to this, right? And necessarily so. All right, so we have a bride. And, uh, and, and, and if you haven't seen this, what I'm trying to say, the pre-tribulation harvest or rapture of the bride is a reward. And does that mean that, uh, that you're not going to go in a rapture? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. If you are saved, you will be raptured, harvested, gathered, whichever term you're wanting to use that. It's when that occurs based on which group you are a part of. Um, not everyone gets all the same rewards. That, that just doesn't happen, right? Um, and, uh, and so uh, think about it this way. You may not want all of the rewards. Uh, if you are a living saint, then chances are you're not going to get a martyr's crown, right? Would you rather have the martyr's crown? Hmm, not me, not me. Uh, but the, the 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 idea is, I I I want the crown, but that is related to waiting for His glorious appearing, just like Paul did, right? And I think that that is the crown, the reward that goes to the bride. She is going to be crowned as the bride, and that's going to be the pre-tribulation part. All right. Now let's take a look at the wedding preparations. Just uh, no, no, no. Let's let's go along. The, let me just quickly point this out. These are the judgments. Okay. Ah, sorry, folks. All right. Let me show you this one. Okay. And this is dealing with the judgments. I'm sorry, well, it's about, it's hard for me to tell if this is in focus. I hope that you can see this well. All right. So the judgments, all right. <clears throat> You've got the Bema seat of Christ. It is a judgment seat, okay? There are judgments there, and there are rewards that are given, our crowns, our assignments. Now, he talks about the kingdom parables, talents, virgins, uninvited guests, all of those particular uh, things, all of the kingdom parables, right? And the call of the bride to the marriage of the lamb, the bride of Messiah. And it's all under the Bema seat of Christ. So in other words, that's where, that's where a crown is going to be awarded for the bride, which is going to be the pre-tribulation part of that, okay? Now, I like this comparison the bride of Messiah versus the adulterous wife of Yahweh. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that, that there is a huge difference there, right? But what I'm trying to point out here is out of the list of judgments, there, we see three different judgments. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, it is for rewards. It's not to send people uh, you know, cast them off into hell or anything, but it's still a judgment nonetheless, right? You're judged based on the works that you had while you were here. All right. Um, your works in the kingdom, your works for the Lord after salvation, folks. Okay. So this isn't a salvation issue. I'm talking about what did you do? Your faithful works. All right. Your works of righteousness after salvation. So that's going to be evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. Then we've got a sheep and goat judgment. That's a uh, second one. Then we've got a great white throne judgment. There's a third one. What's interesting is even in the sheep and goat judgment, you can see on the earth, there are three separate parties involved. Three, three, three. Are you getting this? Okay. All right. So what I'm trying to point out is that if we keep pointing out groups of three in all of this, three that's related to judgments, three that's related to separating groups out, three as related to the harvest, how, how, I, I'm just, I, I don't know how you can miss it. 
I, I really don't. Okay. All right. So, but let's let's um, let's move on, and and I'm just hoping that it's going to help you to see that you know there 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 are three groups. There are three groups. All right. Now let's go back and let's talk about having a bridal gown without spot or wrinkle. Okay. Now, how do you do that? Who does that? Right? Now, here's the thing, and this is what I want you to understand. Follow me just for a minute. Let's assume that you're saved, okay? I'm going based on the assumption that you are a saved individual. You are a believer in Christ. You have received the free gift of salvation and you are saved, okay? All right. That means that you are going to take part in the resurrection. You are not going to taste of the second death, right? You are not going to be touched by the lake of fire. You are saved, okay? Now, the question then is, how you know, what, what do we do after the salvation? What does works have anything to do with after the salvation? Well, what I'm trying to point out is that if we then look at the reward scheme, right, and we see that you will be in either the first or the second harvest, and that the bride taken out of the body goes first, the body goes second, and then the remnant uh, of the, the Jewish remnant that will go last, right? All of that and everyone else through all of history that are a part of those groups will end up uh, going in the resurrection. But the uh you won't suffer wrath well yeah of course but does does that mean that you won't be going into does that mean that you wouldn't be uh here for the first part of the tribulation period no i don't think so at all and uh and and so my point is that there is a way to be prepared there is a way to be prepared uh, and so one of those things is wedding preparations. Now, once again, this is not mine. This is from Brother Missler. So let's look at this. Okay. This is the wedding preparations. Um, I hope that you can see that well enough. Okay. All right. And what this is saying, the wedding preparations how does the bride prepare? Remember, the bride has made herself ready. Okay? Now, this is interesting. Wedding preparations. First, you have to wash. Then you have to anoint thee. And then put thy raiment upon thee. This is out of Ruth chapter 3, verse 3. And this is what uh, Naomi tells Ruth that she needs to do that before she goes down to the threshing floor, she needs to wash herself. Then she needs to anoint her body. Then she's got to put on her best raiment, right? Put thy raiment upon thee, but it's her best raiment, right? Then you go there. So in other words, you don't put on the raiment first. You got to wash first. Then you got to be anointed. Then you got to put your raiment on. All right. Now, so uh, what you can see out of this, uh, there's plenty of things talking about the washing. That's Ephesians 5, 25 and verse 26. And in 1 John 1, verse 9, uh, anointing the extra oil, the five virgins, 
why are you going to need extra oil? How is that going to work? That's the double portion. That's what I'm telling you. Please check out my messages dealing with the 10 virgins are bridesmaids. They are companions to the bride. They are not the bride. And when you see this and you understand that, then it's going to open up some more understanding to you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. The church as the main part of the body that is left behind will receive a double portion, right? They are going to have extra oil. That is just like Elijah and Elisha. Elijah uh, went up and he said, for Elisha's sake, he says, if you see me when I go, then you will have what you request. What did he request? I want a double portion of your spirit. He saw him go. He wasn't taken, he being Elisha. And, uh, and he received, uh, you know, he tears his clothes off. He's in grief. He's calling out, my father, my father. He saw him go. Why didn't they both go, right? There was one that was left behind that was Elisha. Were they both believers? Were they both part of the, you know, the, the same group? Yes, but one went first and then uh, Elisha was left behind, but he received a double portion. And he did, what's really interesting when you look at this, you know how many miracles that Elisha did versus Elijah? He did twice as many. Why? Because he had a double portion. Do you understand? That's really good. Now, so that's what's going to happen when the church as a whole, that is not the bride, is uh, left behind for the first part. They are going to be doing amazing things. Greater works have you uh, never been seen like that. That's what's going to happen during this time period, right? They have an amazing uh, 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 program or part of this uh, plan, God's plan for them. That That's their part, okay? All right. Holy Spirit given is given in response to obedience. And this is interesting, uh, anointing. Rebecca, she alighted and put her veil upon herself. Now, so that's, did, did someone else put her veil on her? No, she put her veil on her. That's in Genesis 24, verses 64 and 65. Preparation. The bride has arrayed herself with righteous acts. That's Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Then, what does it say? So, she is clothed with the righteous acts of saints. She's arrayed herself, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that who had set all this up. Well, God has made all of this possible, of course, but there, there's a part that we play in this, folks. We don't just, we're not just passive participants in this life. We are expected to do something. We can't be like the person who just took, well, thanks for this, this talent, I'm going to go ahead and bury it in the sand. And then when you come back, I'll give it back to you. No, it's not about that. We got to do something, right? Let's be a part of this. We are to keep our own garments. And my goodness, folks, how many verses do we have that says that right there? Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. 1 John 2, verse 28. Titus 3, verse 8, 2 John 1, verse 8. There are more, actually, but I hope you get the point, right? We are to keep our garments. We are to make sure that we do that ourselves. And what the most important part of this is, wedding garments are expensive. Jesus paid for his bride with his life. And we have to prepare our garments. They are expensive. Revelation 3, verse 18, and Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And I hope that you will look that up. Brothers and sisters, 
I just hope that you are excited about what is about to take place. Be a part of this. Be a part of this. I, I, I am speaking, of course, to those who desire that deep and intimate relationship with Jesus. And I hope that you, I want, I, I want you, I want you to, to be with the rest of the bride when that rapture trumpet sounds. And it's about to sound, and it's about to sound any moment now. I really feel that it is so close. But if you're not, you know, does that mean that you are not going to be a part of a rapture? No, it actually does not. It, it means that you will be, but when you are going to be taken and without seeing wrath, will be in the second group. Okay? It just means that, it, just like Brother uh, Lee Brainerd had said, there are a group of people that are goal oriented. They are work focused, right? And they and that that's what the deal is. They want to get things done. They are Marthas, okay? And but they are going to have double double the anointing that anyone else that we are going to see things that have never taken place in all of human history. It's going to happen during that time period. It's going to be the greatest harvest in all of mankind's history. It's going to take place then. So wherever you are, wherever you are, I praise God for each and every one of you, brothers and sisters. And I, I love you. I truly do. Be open to Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I truly ask that you open up the eyes and the ears and the minds and the hearts of those that are hearing this, that your wisdom will be imparted to them, and they are going to praise and honor you. You, Jesus, you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you don't know this Jesus, the lover of your soul, I, I'm saying right now is this this could be the very last moment, the very last chance before the rapture of the bride takes place. And so I'm saying, do this now. Jesus, God, very God, came and was born into flesh, the man Jesus. And he died to pay that sin debt that you couldn't pay for. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. And if you want to know that love, if you want to know that Jesus, then I'm asking for you to believe that he is who he says he is. He died on that cross. He was buried. And after three days, he rose again to life. He's alive forevermore. Amen. I'm asking that you believe that, not, not just here, not just here, but believe it here. He's the only one that can save you. He is the only one, but I'm telling you, you want to know this love. You truly, truly do. And I pray that you do that now. I'm in brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. This is it. Get ready to hear the trumpet sound. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Maranatha. <laughs>